Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rest is Entertainment with me, Marina Hyde. And me, Richard Osman. How are you, Marina? I'm very well, thank you, Richard. And how are you doing? I'm all right. I watched The Sound of Music for the first time ever yesterday. <gasps> Did you now? Yeah. Tell me. Yeah, it's all right, isn't it? I mean, it's more Nazis than I thought. But you even went to Salzburg on part of your honeymoon and you yeah. haven't seen The Sound of Music. I haven't music. seen The Sound of Music, but well, I've, been, I've been made to finally. It's my wife's <laughs> birthday, so she said, let's watch The Sound of Music. I always feel that, he, that his parenting methods were absolutely fine. He had seven children with the whistle what's wrong with the whistle he's got seven kids no help from that baroness when uh, I lined it up and I pressed pause just at the start and I saw it was two hours 55 it minutes long it's a joke the length and it is and I did say to Ingrid when she walked in anything else you want to tell me about this film <laughs> she hadn't told me it was three hours long I really enjoyed it anyway I hadn't watched Top Gun before I'd met her Singing what? in the Rain I hadn't watched I'm amazed you hadn't watched Top Gun yeah. I, singing, I could accept all those but how would you not watch Top Gun how would you manage to get through the 80s and not watched it we've all got blind spots I'm like an articulated lorry. You've got to be careful overtaking me. <laughs> We're going to start with AI. I feel like this might have been a tipping point. There was, there was a video release called Sora, um, which was released by OpenAI. And if, if you haven't seen it, you must take a look. They're the people who have created ChatGPT. Exactly, course, which, so. which even sort of 18 months ago was just, isn't this fun? You can sort of ask it a question about your school and it'll tell you something. And now is going to be a behemoth which takes over all of Hollywood and all of our culture. So this video came out and it's it's a text to video application where it says, Sora, you know, show me a kitten playing with a candle. Shall I tell you some of the prompts that they put in? Yes, Cause they're please. quite interesting. A gorgeously rendered paper craft world of a coral reef, rife with colourful fish and sea creatures. I honestly get, I urge you to go and see what they created. It is unbelievable. Mm. It's all AI, it's all CGI. Uh, there was another one, a movie trailer featuring the adventures of the 30-year-old spaceman wearing a red wool knitted motorcycle helmet, cinematic style, shot on 35mm film, and it is extraordinary. It's terrifyingly extraordinary what has been produced by this thing. I think so, and it's one, it's, it's one of those things, it's funny, it's only a sort of eight-minute long video, but I think it's the week that Hollywood finally went, oh, OK oh, I get it, that this is a tide that's not um, going to turn back. Um, they said it out loud. I mean, um, a, the director actually of one of the directors of Slow Horses, um, which is obviously filmed over here, but um, was in front of MPs and said, I've seen this. I now think it will be producing feature films in three to five years. It could probably do soap operas now. And um, Tyler Perry, who's a big producer, said, I'm not going to expand my studio lot, which I was going to do because there's just no point having seen this thing. It's going to take over everything. Well, that's it. He was a ty Tyler Perry, who's, who's huge in the States, has a huge media empire. He was about to spend $800 million expanding his studio. He in, says in, he was. In, in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, OK. Uh, all right, he was about to spend yeah. seven and a half grand <laughs> yeah. uh, because he, he got a cheaper quote. I mean, his quote. films do slightly feel like AI anyway, I always think. But anyhow, um, in general, it has sent a chill through the industry. People are saying, oh, my God, OK, having seen that, concept art just died. Uh, storyboard, stock video, that just died. Yeah. Well, I think stock video definitely just died. Um, storyboarding just died. Previs, which is a way that um, movie um, shots are conceived of. Artists create a previs of what the scene will look like exactly. And it takes a while to get there. And then you're almost as the actor shown that scene, particularly if it's an action scene or something that's going to be quite hard to explain. So you're actually able to see what it might, you know, in a kind of rudimentary way. But someone has had to create that and it's had to create it over many, many iterations. You don't get the previs right first time um, and people are saying well that's just died because you can just type in a few text prompts what's interesting is that you can also feed video into this model so you could say I'm really sorry this movie stars Kevin Spacey who I regard to be what my friend Julie refers to as one of the league of semi-cancelled men so can you now <laughs> remove it and put somebody else in it and they can they can yeah. do that well actually uh, can, can you replace them with someone that you've entirely invented well, yes, That's the other can, thing that you... AI is going to be able to do very, very quickly and very, very easily. Now, OpenAI are saying they're not releasing this model in the way that they have to chat GPT because they want to take in uh, conversations from stakeholders and policymakers and all the other people who aren't going to have a job soon either. So, I mean, it's 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 fascinating, and the most fascinating thing, of course, is is the absolute sort of exponential leap that this technology is making. So, you know, we're we're at the stage talking about Sora now. In 50 years' time, they can listen back to this and go, ah, oh, that's cute. It's like we talk about, yeah. do you remember the first time they ever showed moving pictures in a French cinema and, and people ran out of the cinema because they thought a train was going to come yeah. through the screen? Yeah. They'll be talking about us like that because this is the very beginning of a very, very, very long journey. Now, if there's any hope for the industry at all, it is that 
it's quite hard to do the next generation of AI. Each time we sort of go up a generation, um, it's using more power, it's using more computers, and it's using more source material. Uh, and those are exponential. I think they... The source material, by the way, all of yeah. which has been created by humans. I know, which we will get to, I think, yeah. about what happens with those eventual lawsuits. Uh, yeah. I have a theory as to what might happen yeah. with that lawsuit, and it will, it will not shock you to know that uh, rich people will do well and poorer people will do less well. Um, but I think by the time of chat GPT-7, it's going to use uh, every single computer in the world will be needed to be used. You'll need a, your own nuclear reactor to power it, uh, and it will require more source material than there is currently in the world. Okay. Oh um, now, the thing that holds up all of that, of course, is you can't use all the computers in the world, so you've got to manufacture chips, and manufacturing chips is quite a slow process. The lithium wars, yeah. The, 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 <laughs> oh, no, that's a good There's show. another thing you yeah. can look forward to. A, AI, uh, AI, make lithium wars. Show me the lithium wars, yes. Um, so, in theory... AI could now take quite a long time. And equally, it might have that last mile problem that uh, that driverless cars have, which is it's easy to get to 90% brilliant, but actually the last 10% is incredibly hard. But don't you think to some extent we live in a, I saw someone calling it the other day, a good enough, a just good enough culture. You know, a lot of the stuff that people will spend all day watching on stuff like TikTok, YouTube yeah. is lo-fi. It's not got high production yeah. values and they don't mind the kind of shonkiness of it to some extent. And so... That worries me that that the, the, the kind of artistry is something that people are already willing to forego in the things that they spend the most of their day doing anyway. I think that's right. I think I think the industry will be hollowed out. And I, I, I use that term very specifically, by which I mean, at the top end, there's always going to be auteurs and artisans and people will pay a premium for humanity just as, as people doing shops. But the people doing that, of course, will be rich people. There'll be two track culture. And at the very top end, there will always be projects with gatekeepers and done by people who are already in the industry and already have connections who will make that stuff. And at the bottom end, there will, of course, be loads of scrappy you know, producers, content creators who do what they always do, which is have great ideas and just you know, put them down. Uh, it's the stuff in the middle that goes, linear television, um, yeah, just the background stuff we watch day to day. And there's absolutely no reason in two years' time why a human being should be anywhere near that. So you've got whatever library of programmes you've got, whatever library of comedy shows, stuff that was made in the 80s or 90s or noughties, um, no reason at all for AI not to take, take control of the advertising because one of the things it does is hyper, hyper targeted. I mean, AI will be unbelievably good at advertising. To you. The you, algorithm... You'll see this in commercials. That should yeah. be the first thing we say. You'll see this in commercials imminently. I mean, they yeah. will already be using this in commercials, like, immediately. There's no reason. It, this is good enough easily for adverts, easily already. 100% that. I think the advertising it's industry good in some ways. is in a lot of trouble, which, of course, means that linear television is in an awful yeah. lot of trouble because it's not suddenly going to be, oh, phew, everyone started making really expensive adverts again and then just sort of throwing them into Coronation Street and the yeah. hope that some people watch. It would be, I'm going to get AI to make an advert for me it's going to have an AI voiceover and it's going to be targeted to exactly the people I want it to be targeted to. And it's going to be insanely cheap and it's going to be just as useful as the advertising I do now. So I think it means that that all goes as well. So I think AI is going to be hugely influential. I think it's going to lose an awful lot of jobs. The only thing that can happen is that it slows down. Uh, and at the moment, it will slow down because it's hard to make chips. Can I just say something that I do think is quite interesting about all of this? As uh, obviously one of the one of the unions I'm a member of is the Writers Guild of America, and we were one of the unions that went on strike last summer. But there's something quite funny about how a, a big part of what we were on strike about is a, the, is AI and the use of AI in the writers' case, the use of AI either to um, create, to replace you, or but all of which has been built, by the way, on work written by actual yeah. writers who, you know, had emotional breakdowns and went to fat camp and all the different things that happen in people's yeah, lives writers. that make you, you know, writers. Yeah. And also to say, you know, I don't ever want to have to be made to write a, a script that's been perhaps, you know, generated by an AI and then I work on it as a yeah. polish at the end, you know. Um, and the screen actors had their own, um, obviously, same issues. You know, they didn't want to be um, easily replaced, all sorts of things like that. And both guilds won on those kind of points and they were happy with what they got. I felt at the time that, you know, the reasons that the studios are allowing them to win are because it's just not good enough yet. Yeah. But you can be sure that the minute it is good enough, the technology, then we'll be having a whole nother conversation in three years when the deals are up again. Having said all that, it's quite an unusual that sort of airy fairy industries, the writers, the screenwriters and the actors have been 
had the most high profile labor disputes about this kind of across the world. Yeah. Um, and the, because these are about issues that are going to affect the complete wide labor market, like everybody. And it's funny that actors in a way and screenwriters have been at the forefront of that in, a, in quite a high profile work because it's coming for everyone. What I will say about policymakers is that one of the things we've seen over the past few years is how they're sort of always fighting the last war, if you're lucky, yeah. or the last war but one. You know, the Conservatives making a big deal about the sort of online harms bill, which, you know, I appreciate mattered to lots of them. And But you now look at things like this and think, where are we on this? I mean, this is much, much bigger. Yeah. This is bigger than everything. And it's there, like, it's the, like they're, they're still talking about someone waving a red flag in front of a steam train when yeah. uh, when full electrification has taken place. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's the difficulty is keeping up. And I mean, the, the US Labour Secretary is very interested in all of this stuff. And I don't know, she, I think she was at the Screen Actors Guild Awards these, this last weekend. You can be sure that they're... And she, I think she would sort of relish the fact that actors and screenwriters were at the front of these fights, but they are labour market-wide now, that these this AI is going to replace so many jobs. I think so, and it's, it's fascinating because there's, 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 there's two attacks as well, which is if you won one of the big studios, of course you're going to try and use AI as much as you can because we know that's what, uh, that's what capitalism is and it has to be rapacious and it has to keep growing. Um, so they will find a way to do it. But also if you're a new creator in the industry, if you're a new brain, and by the way, it's quite hard to get into the industry and you have these tools at your disposal, you would just be using them. If you're a yeah, young filmmaker, I remember I remember a very, very young Edgar Wright when he was starting out and him and his friends would just make these little home movies on videos because that was a new technology that yeah. they that they could suddenly use. If you're a young person now, a young writer, a young creator, a young, young director, a young actor, why would you not be using these AI tools to make incredible content and sharing it with people? And of course, if that's your way into the industry and suddenly people say, oh, no, but if you want to join the Screen Actors Guild, if you want to join Equity, if you want to you know, be a, a Hollywood director, you have to sign up to these things which says you can't use all these technologies. You go, well, then I, then I won't join up. Then I, yeah. And also there's an irony, which is a lot of creatives are very excited about what they could do with AI. You know, you talk to writers and they know it's going to end their jobs, but they also go, God, there'd be a fascinating project I could do with AI. I wonder what it could do, or I could add pictures to the things that I'm doing. Perhaps I could cut the other people in this industry out of what I'm doing. I think Sam Altman from OpenAI says, I want $7 trillion to spend on making chips, by which he means I want to set up factories that make chips. And if I do that, then we could, then AI can advance at the pace it is now. If someone doesn't give him $7 trillion, then it will take a long time. AI will advance as quickly as the manufacturing output of chip companies uh, can go. I mean, that's essentially the mass of the thing. But if the next iteration of chat GPT, which you can just about do with the computing power that exists on planet Earth and the source material, if that is another huge step on, then of course people will give them $7 trillion. Yes. I mean, it, it will be literally nothing. And then the next one of it, chat GPT-6, might be able to solve a lot of the problems about making chips and might be able to solve lots of the problems about <laughs> how you power it and might be able to solve lots of the problems of there not being as much source material because it can start creating its own stuff. So it's one of those things. If we just allow the market now to be what it is, then it could be five, six, seven, eight years before we get the most unbelievable, the, the stuff that can make everything. But if OpenAI and Sam Altman are able to intervene now and put $7 trillion into it, then this is coming like super, super quickly. And I think that politicians will become engaged with the issue purely because they will see how it will disrupt their... Ele I mean, this year yeah. we will be... De see, I mean, obviously James Cleverley's talked about it even this week. We're going to be seeing a lot of AI disruption in both uh, in our election and in, in the US election. And it will, I'm sure, certainly crystallise their mm. thinking as to ha how to regulate this and how, and how to deal with it. Because, of course, the entire way that ChatGPT works is it crawls the internet for available works, television shows, images, text, books and stuff like that, and trains the AI on that. So it's, it's taken the IP, the intellectual property, of millions of creators uh, and it's essentially passing it off as its own in an enormously clever way. But, you know, it didn't create any of that stuff. It is not a real thing. It is, it is some lines of code on a chip. Uh, and every single thing it does and will ever do throughout the whole rest of history of time has already been created by other people. So those people, I think, will seek recourse. Uh, and I suspect that 95% of them will get to no recourse I at all. I think 99.999% of them. It's because it's every it's the sum of human everything, really, that it's drawing upon. And The sum of human everything. Yes, but it by is. By Marina Hyde. <laughs>
<laughs> yes, I'm just doing the outline for that now. But I don't know what you think about it. I think that essentially, like 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 music streaming, really, the big studios will settle for an enormous amount of money because the open AIs of this world will be multi, multi, multi trillion dollar industries. They can they can throw you like 100 billion without even thinking about it. So the big studios will settle for huge amounts of money. They will make sure their big stars are taken care of out of that money. And they will then think we've reached a tipping point. We don't have to worry anymore. And anyone else who ever created anything um, is not going to get any money at all because what you created belongs to the studios. And if so, if they've done a deal, with the open AI companies, then you don't really have a leg to stand on. What would be your take on that? That I feels like... That, that, that absolutely, the other thing I would say is that expect to see huge amounts more really quite imminently of animations because oh. the animation that this thing could produce, it could produce some sort of cute little kind of monstery thing. It could be vaguely Pixarish. It could be, who knows? It could be one of the sort of animation houses. Yeah. And it, that already looked like something that you would see out there in out there in the theatres. But it's amazing. I've you seen know, worse, let's put it that way. <laughs> I've sat through worse with my children. Yeah, but yeah. As you say, listen, it's not going to, you know, people say, look, yeah, but you'll always have to have the human voice and the human emotion. And you will, but that would be really, really top end stuff because, you know, that's that's going to be the expensive stuff to make. And no one likes making expensive stuff, but there will always be those prestige projects. As I say, at the bottom, there will always be people, people doing interesting things because you, you can't keep the creative mind down. But that entire middle of the industry, which is where everyone I've, you know, worked with my whole life works, you know, it's, it's going to be really, really tough times, I think. Absolutely. And there's Absolutely. no it safety is. net put in place. But it's the middle of culture that will disappear and be replaced by AI, I suspect. And it's... Yeah. And it's coming soon and it'll come sooner. As if we, always, if... the middle in everything is going in the way that mid-budget films have fallen away. and um, That kind of middle bankable quality stuff has gone. And yeah. at the moment, I cannot see a pathway to it coming back. Well, my only optimistic take would be for anyone out there and anyone who's thinking about how to fight back would be this. Currently, the studios are so massive because you have to spend $100 million to make a movie and to market a movie. And therefore, everything has to go through that filter and through that funnel. Um and that's why a lot of the smaller movies don't happen now. If you are suddenly able to make a smaller movie for a tenth of the price and you are able to market it, more importantly, for a tenth of the price, then perhaps there might be a sort of united artist type, you know, fight back where we go, actually, we're going to use AI to make our product cheaper, but with a human hand and a human touch and to market it more easily uh, and to have, a you know, a movement that's, that says, listen, we'll use AI but we want to make human product. But that doesn't help the service industry to um, to films and movies and television. That doesn't help, the, as you say, the kind of the CGI uh, world and all of those things. But in terms of the creativity that might be out there, it might be that we swing back in the opposite direction and we, we, we mount a fight back. And, you know, there's so many, I know lots of writers and producers and stuff listen to this and that it, it, it feels like there's something there that we could maybe do, but it's going to be a, a, a hell of a fight. It is. And it's really worth taking a look at, at the quality of what was produced. And clearly you can see in some of them the kind of drawbacks of it, but it's worth seeing it for yourself. So go and I would recommend having a look. Yeah. And the, your your constant reaction is is, is is a mix of wow and oh no. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's yeah. listen. The rest is entertainment in 20 years' time. It's going to be very, very different. Firstly, we won't be presenting it. It'll oh, no, be, podcasts, uh... as I've said to you before, these are hu podcasts are hugely vulnerable to AI. I would have thought that they were more vulnerable than almost anything. Um, but do, do you not think the very essence of podcasts is it is a is, is a human interaction? Oh, I think it's quite possible to fake it. I'm sorry to say. I mean, I wish I could be more optimistic, but I think you'd be quite surprised. I tell you what, uh, what, having what, looked at those video images, I think you'd be quite surprised of what, what any of it can do. Why don't we try next week? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Well, Rory Stewart is AI. A lot of people don't know that, do they? It's amazing. <laughs> Completely generated. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he literally, he's, he's never spoken a word on that podcast. He's very happily living wherever he lives. And he's, uh, yeah, just Alistair Campbell talking to a robot. It's, he's, you know? Yes. And he, so, and he sold a lot of books. <laughs> We are going to talk about the Sussexes and the Obamas, people who obviously come from outside of the entertainment industry. They were given big, big deals, overall deals, as we call them. I'll talk about those in just a second. They both got them with uh, Netflix and with Spotify. Um, obviously, they also have their own publishing deals. The Obamas, I can't remember what their... their theirs was eight figures. The Sussexes was nine figures. It was more than 100 million. Then Netflix says, we will cover all your production company. You know, we'll cover all your overheads. Um, 
But anything you develop and produce is for us. It's not a first look deal. It can't, if we don't like it, go somewhere else. It lives and dies with us. Um, they don't give you a check for $100 million up front. It is contingent on you kind of producing a certain amount of material. Now, the Obamas have produced quite a lot of stuff um, and that Netflix have actually renewed with them. And it's obviously very prestigious to have... They've won Oscars of, as well. They've, they've, they've won, there's a documentary of there's won Oscars. American and they're, they've. They are clearly very engaged. They are obviously deep thinkers. They want to curate stuff. Um, they and employ good people. They employ very, very good people. And um, there is a prestige to having them. And when the streamers, and I'm talking about Spotify as well as someone like Netflix, were trying to build out, were trying to become, were trying to race for scale and to become these huge things, it is a big, big prestige thing to sign the Obamas. And you can see why Spotify paid the same for the Obamas as they did for Joe Rogan. I can wow. tell you, 25 million was a sort of magic number in those days. And I can tell you they've obviously done all the better out of the Joe Rogan deal. Yeah. The Sussexes, I mean, three years on from that deal, more than three years on now, they have got an Invictus Games documentary. This is the um, games for wounded servicemen and um, it's kind of recovered injured service personnel that Harry began, which is fine, but it's really niche. And then they had the one, but it is. <laughs> I'm like a TV it, yeah, it, it is. Yeah. It's niche. And then they had their show. They had a show for children called Pearl. Cancelled. It never aired. They've bought some film rights, which nothing has happened with. The only thing they have produced is their documentary about themselves, which I think was called Finding Freedom or something ridiculous, which of course has done very well because, in my view. They have one story to tell mm. ever. That is the only interest story anyone is interested to hear for them, which is the stories of their grievances with the royal family. That's it. They do not, as far as I'm concerned, tell me what their brand is. I mean, they are a brand of grievance. I, I would really worry about what his therapist says to him because I would say, you know, your moneymaker is this kind of discord with your family. And it seems to me it would be quite good to be able to separate those two things mm. in the interest of moving forward and personal growth and healing. But that is the only way they can make money, in my view. And I think Netflix have got into a whole world of pain. World of pain. What do you think? I mean, well, yeah, it's 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 fascinating, isn't it? Because the Netflix deal seems to have sort of come to an end. I mean, Netflix are not really admitting that; they're not really admitting it. Certainly, the Spotify deal has come to an end. Meghan Markle did a a, a podcast and called she did Archetypes. twelve episodes did of a podcast. Wow! I mean, that's like a a Monday morning for you and I. Yeah, and they were she got they got sort of twenty million dollars for that, and they she did twelve episodes. It came to an end. My uh, goodness, there was that that guy. Did you see that Bill Simmons who started the Ringer Network of pos, podcasts, who is sort of very brilliant, and which he eventually sold to Spotify, and he has a sort of executive position there. He said on his own podcast, "I wish I had been involved in the Meghan and Harry leave Spotify negotiation. The fucking grifters. That's the podcast we should have launched with them." <laughs> I've got to get drunk one night and tell the story of the Zoom I had with Harry to try and help him with a podcast idea. It's one of my best stories. Fuck them, the grifters. <laughs> Which is, you know, opaque. It's not clear what he thinks about them. But yeah, I mean... Yeah. So but listen, we're, we're in an industry where that happens all the time. As soon as someone gets a big name, they can sign a big output deal. The talented ones, it pays off for everybody. The untalented ones, you soon work out, you think, oh, you were just flavour of the month for yeah. a little bit and I've massively overpaid for you. Which is why always in, in, uh, in TV... Strike when you're when 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 you know you're absolutely at the top of your game because you can get an enormous deal and then you know Netflix and whatever can repent at leisure. So it's <laughs> it's not it's it's quite an old story. They they haven't got it because you know because it's some miracle. It's often when people are absolutely at the height of their powers, someone else will overpay for them massively. Uh, and I've always hated because you go what you're not gonna what are you gonna get for a hundred million? I don't get what I you mean, think you're going to get. They've just got a production company, and they're what are they coming and pitching you game shows? As you say, the only interesting thing is when they're on screen. It's the same as Simon Cowell. Simon Cowell only has hits when he's on screen because yeah. people love to watch him. As soon as he goes, oh, actually, I've got another, I've got, I've got a game show, or I've got a I'm reality show. I'm curating a game show. Yeah. No thanks. Yeah, nobody watches because it's not. It's you just think, well, there's there's no value there. Your value is your on screen persona. I'll say this about. Harry and Meghan. So it looks like it's being a bad time for them, you know, with, with Netflix and, and, and with Spotify. The book that Harry wrote. Oh, speaking of the Sussex Extended Universe, this yeah. is, yeah. But it's impossible to overestimate how much money that has made. I mean, it's been one of the most successful books. If you want to talk about figures they signed, wasn't that, didn't they pay 
something like 20 million. Maybe they paid even less a for 20, that. A 20 million advance for, uh, for that for book. For four books. Doesn't matter what any oh, of the other three books? do. Yeah, for four. Doesn't matter what any of the other three do now, by the way. That book sold more than anything ever, literally. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, it was the, extraordinary. The fastest selling nonfiction book of all time. I've done some back of the envelope uh, the calculations because because I like to I know I know what what you get paid per book You've got a 20 million advance the thing with advance is you get paid in advance 20 million in that case you do not make a penny until your publisher makes back their yeah. 20 million and once they've made back their 20 million and, th and there's all sorts of sliding scales about how how that works what they get what you get uh, once you've made the, the 20 million then you get your royalties i think and his book has not come out in paperback yet so his book is purely hardback. Uh, I reckon he's made twenty six, twenty seven million dollars. So he's earned out an advance of twenty million on the hardback on the of hardback. his first book alone. Forget rights to uh, you know other things and audio books and, and and what have you. He has earned that out already. When the paperback comes out, that's it. It's just it's just money rolling into the. That's Penguin Sussexes. Random House who did that deal, by the way, yeah. and they did an unbelievably good deal. Three more books. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean it's, it's, but that's the weird thing, isn't it? Netflix, Spotify, those are both bad deals. But the book, because that's the thing, because that's Harry. It's like the it's essence of Harry. That's the thing you're buying, and that's the thing that people want most of. And I know um, uh, the uh, Murringer wrote, wrote the book with Harry, and he's been handsomely paid for it as well. But sometimes when I um, tweet out the, the kind of book charts, people always go, oh, yeah, but it's not a hit because I've seen it in charity shops, so it was half price. It is the biggest hit yeah. of the last 10, 20 years. It is enormous. It has made everybody an enormous amount of money. People say, oh, but it's on half price. You think, yeah, all but books tend to, you know, if you're in a Waterstones or the supermarkets, they get knocked down to half price. You That's want why. your book to be knocked down because Ex if, exactly your, if your book's one of the one being knocked down yeah. at half price, then yeah. it, you're selling a lot. And also, by the way, Harry is not making less money if it's half price. No. It's, he makes exactly the same if, if you charge $28 and if you charge uh, $14. Also, he sells a lot in America. In America, the royalties are absolutely insane because they pay a lot of money for books in America. So he has made a huge amount of money out of that book. So he's got money coming in. Uh, and Meghan, the only thing we really know her from acting is Suits. And Suits in the last year has become the biggest show in the world. So as a couple, they've essentially got the biggest book in the world and the biggest TV show in the world. Now, I'm sure she's not making a huge amount from Suits. She's not. But... As a power couple, you know, forget Netflix and Spotify. That's not bad, isn't it? I mean, it's not, you know, Taylor Swift and Travis Kelce, but it's, it's not bad having the biggest book in the world and being in the biggest TV not show in all, the world. Not at all, but but the only way to move it forward is to is to, is to go back oh, yeah. to the grievance well. And, yeah. and uh, it, it's... <laughs> That's it's a bit like being, yeah, I know, but it's a bit like being sort of an ancient mariner, really. You're sort of content to tell the same story to every single person. But I must say that the obverse of that, of course, is that it is in the media's interest who kind of stoke this flame the yes. whole time, and the um, the people who, you know, the, if you end up writing about Harry and Meghan a lot in a kind of negative way, you need them to behave in a certain way, and they need every it, you're just, uh, you know this horrible sort of parasitic relationship. That's really what it is. And, and and it must be tricky for them to sort of, they must have worked out by now that that's, the, that's where their money is going to come from. I don't think they did think that actually at the start. No, at the and start, I think what's I think interesting right. is that he has all hit, for all the fact that I do think he's had, a, you know, awful things have happened to him. And it, it, I can't imagine sort of growing up in that horrific way and in that sort of awful fishbowl and what have you. Having said that, within that, people always told him he was very, very important. Mm. And he was within that specific setup. He's now in, what, am I supposed to believe he's in Hollywood? Don't do me a favour. I mean, this is a, an actual meritocracy or a form of meritocracy. And all anybody cares about is your ratings and your numbers. And if you can't get those, it doesn't matter. It honestly doesn't matter. There's plenty of bigger names mm. than him, really, in terms of stardom, who have just stopped making people money and they not nobody is interested. It's brutal. I know. As yeah. I said, it's. But it's, that's that's yeah. It's the difference between show business and royalty. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and um, I'm afraid that that is that's the difficulty. And you know, I saw people say, I saw her saying, people are connected with it saying that the reason they put so little out on Netflix is because she's cautious. But you know, leading by her truth is always her north star. It's like okay, oh, come on. nobody cares about your north star. Yeah. They just care about your numbers. Yeah, and they they want to be entertained. Yeah. Okay, we're not we're not interested in how hard you know in for anybody. 
We are not interested in how hard it is to be you. We're interested in whether you've written Breaking Bad or not. And they're, meanwhile, they're part of that lovely LA diaspora, which is sort of people who are much more famous over here. But where you've got Harry, you've got Robbie Williams, you've got David Beckham, and Rishi Sunak, of course, will be heading out there, <laughs> I suspect, to the end. I mean, you know he will. He'll be in LA, right? Finally, a gang of four. Yeah, well, there we go. Um, but the Obamas, meanwhile, not only have done, you know, genuine, they, they did uh, Rust in the, the show. That's again nom- nominated for. Uh, an Oscar. They've done amazing things, but their books were insane. Harry's is the fastest yeah. selling in that, you know, it sold incredibly quickly in terms of the the best selling nonfiction book ever, forgetting the Bible, etc., is Michelle Obama's yeah. Becoming, Becoming, which is 14 million. Barack Obama's A Promised Land sold a huge amount as well. So, you know, that whatever they do, every single thing they do um, turns to gold. Everything I do turns to sold, as an old apprentice <laughs> candidate once said, and that's the case with the Obamas. But and and also, they have a hinterland, so they can keep coming up with stuff, and people trust them and will come to them, and creatives will come to them, and they will listen to them and do interesting things with them. Yeah, even is... though it didn't particularly, they kind of left Spotify by sort of mutual agreement. I think in the end, they just didn't really renew with them. But they went to Amazon Audible, and so they have, a, they, you know, they can, they're still continuing that, and it is a far more successful. But they're much more engaged, you know. That he I, on the but that does it, that what's that leave the world behind? Is it that's a disaster yeah. movie with Julia Roberts? The Julia Roberts one, yeah. He was get, Obama was giving notes on that. Can no, you imagine getting notes on from that's Obama? A, that's a bleak film. What? Yeah, no, it is quite. Yeah. But getting notes from Obama. I mean, I have to say, I would listen to those. I'm not sure I would like to get notes on my script from Prince Harry. No, thank you. <laughs> so things not as bad as people say for Harry and Meghan, but yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd rather be in business with the Obamas, I think. No, I think it's relatively bad for them. But yes, I would definitely rather be in business with the Obamas. We should go into business reasons. with the Obamas. Yeah, let's... I, I once, we, uh, uh, I think the first Thursday Murder Club book, it beat Barack Obama to Christmas number one. Uh, and I always thought, I wonder, I don't know how much attention he pays to his sales. I, I guess I reckon not, not quite a lot. In the UK. No, but, I reckon a lot. But if they said, oh, no, you're number two uh, in the UK, and he asked why he was number two, maybe he's heard of me. Well, no, oh, can you imagine? It's just once his my name has been mentioned in his room, and he's like, oh, that guy. <laughs> That'd be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, I hope you have come across his radar, Richard. I hope you have. Oh, I, I nice. imagine he pays as much attention to his sales as you do, which is a lot. So I think he's careful. <laughs> I know I think he's careful on things like he's that. Care- Listen, he's come a on, he's a politician. Yeah. Like you, he's a very it's all ca- a numbers he's a, game. He's a very it's careful all, man. <laughs> it's, a, it's a numbers game. Do you have any recommendations? I do, week? actually. I have got... This is um, a magazine that is absolutely brilliant. It's called Strong Words. It's a fascinating thing. It's about books, It's um, but it's written in such a fun and lively and sort of jolly style. It's about all the books, popular books, all types of books coming out. It is conceived created and written by one person. I thought you were going to say a robot. No, I'm not. He is not a robot. He's called Ed Needham. He's ed- edited lots of different magazines in a time, including um, Rolling Stone. He is... It's just an extraordinary undertaking. It's really jolly and a little bit like when you read sort of the London Review of Books and you think... What a fascinating article. Now I no longer have to read that book because mm. we haven't got time to read all the brilliant books that come out. But I have a look for it online. It is so good. I really, really like What's it. What's it called again? Strong Words. Strong, Strong Words. Words magazine. And is it online only? or is No, it, no uh... it's a, it, a print copy comes to you. What, print? What? Huh? Yeah, and it, it's really beautifully laid out and it's very, it's kind of, it's great. It's a great, it's a great thing and I really kind of urge supporting it. And it, as I say, it keeps you on track of every, all the books that are coming out that oh. regrettably we don't all have time to read. Well, then I'll recommend a magazine as well, which is as amazing. There's so much football journalism online, but there's a magazine called um, The Blizzard, or might just be called Blizzard, which gives such deep dives into amazing sort of 1950s Hungarian football and things like that. Yeah, it's terrific, The Blizzard. Okay. Uh, And again, you can find that at uh, WH Smith and various places, but you can also find it online. Um, Because, again, it's that thing when we're talking about AI, there is a fight back sometimes, which is people go, do you know what, I I just want to write this by hand and then have it set by hand and then sell it in a shop to people who can just read it and take a little bit of time reading it. Uh, and that's a fight we're going to have over and over and over and over again in Absolutely. the next 10 and or the... 20 years. So let's, let's, let's start the fight back now. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I just it stepped over that because it, the, when you look at the subscription deals that you can get for so many of these magazines online, they're incredible and you think you're paying so little a month and this thing comes through the post and it is really terrific. So... A thorough recommend to those sort of magazines. And it's that lovely just five minutes where you're not looking at your phone. Yeah. Oh, or maybe four minutes, maybe. <laughs> um, so next week we're doing Saudi Arabia, amongst many other things. Um, thank you. That was uh, 
illuminating. It was most illuminating. We will obviously be back on Thursday for the, the questions edition. Oh, by the way, I have uh, someone asked a question about um, uh, do the people on Gogglebox get paid? And I have a, a good, a very strong Ooh. answer to that now. I found out all about it. And I have a self-administered apology to uh, <gasps> issue, which you oh, know, apologies wait. of the new day too, as we always used to say in newspapers. Uh, so there we go. We'll have a look at that. Lovely. See you Thursday. Bye-bye. 